Davis and Match. Once again, we're about to end the video. There's another paid request from my dear friend Efri, who wanted me to react to some movie trailer compilations. And again, I probably won't be able to show the footage because YouTube will block it, copyright it, or they'll have it up for like a week and then boom, this is blocked, and that part of the video is blocked, and that part is whatever. I mean, it's just stupid stuff, so best way to do it I'm going to try to have the mega upload link for the trailers the compilation and the link down below in the info box if you want to download that and then sync it up with this video feel free that's the best way I could think of doing it but this is two hours 14 minutes and 20 seconds this is Efri's favorite horror films of the 1980s so three two one pressing play. So once again we have Efri introducing the compilation. All time favorite horror movies of the 80's. A lot of good choices in the 80's. Unlike nowadays. Movies that are entertaining, fun. Directors like Wes Craven, George Romero, John Carpenter. Rest in peace, Wes Craven. Rest in peace, George Romero. Rest in peace, Larry Cohen. A lot of directors. <clears throat> You're welcome. Favorite horror films of the 1980s. So we got a TV spot for The Blob. Love The Blob remake. One of the most underrated remakes of all time. I would say the most underrated remake of all time. Definitely one of the best of all time. Highly enjoyable. Great gory, ghastly special effects. Likeable characters. Kevin Dillon, Shawnee Smith. People always reference The Fly and the theme of The Blob. Unjustly ignored. It's how you do a remake the right way. And now we have another TV spot. From the same director who did Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. We're going to direct Eraser with Arnold Schwarzenegger and The Mask with Jim Carrey. And... Sadly, when this film came out, the posters were not the best. If they had the poster from the VHS cover, maybe it would have sold better. And the film did nothing. I think it came out in August or, or something. It just... I don't know if it was bad timing or bad marketing. I don't know why the film didn't do well. Maybe it was one of those films that people didn't even know it was out. But even critics kind of took a dump on it, unjustly so. It's got what you want. It's got humor, it's got clever writing like the kids watching the slasher movie at the theater which was like a take on slasher films, the Garden Tool Massacre of course another great remake John Carpenter's The Thing you have The Blob, The Thing, The Fly one more can be said about John Carpenter's The Thing I saw this film the first time on VHS. I was there was a store called On Q. Uh, that was when I was a kid the best store to go to because I had growing up VHS, CDs, magazines, all sorts of stuff to look into, and that's how I was able to find a lot of movies for the first time, like Dawn of the Dead, this film, and the only thing I had known about it was there was a book. I think it was the Fangoria Horror Films. It was like Horror Films of the 90s, but it was also talking about films of the 80s. And this had a picture of a creature. I'm like, wow, that looks cool. And then you look at the VHS, the back of the cover is just up, up close to Kurt Russell, and it looks like a guy or something on fire. So when I watch it, just the grim, desolate landscape of the Arctic, 
Stephen Cunningham did a wonderful job on the cinematography. The cast all worked well together. I don't think there was a bad actor in the group. From Keith David to Wilford Bramley to... The special effects, mostly by Rob Bottin, is fantastic. Still hold it to this day. It's suspenseful. And such a well-edited trailer. The music, the rapid-fire secession, even the static radio at the beginning and the end. Great tagline, man is the warmest place to hide. Sadly, the film bombed unjustly. Critics called it piece of shit, pretty much. And now it's become a classic. And now we have the remake that was a hit. It's really like the theme was a flop, the blob was a flop, but the fly was a hit. And, I don't know, maybe it was the, the love story that helped it, I don't know, but Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis were an item at the time. So they got together and... People forget, I believe uh, Mel Brooks had a hand in producing the film. Because I think it's like a Brooks film production, and David Cronenberg directed it. There was another director, but sadly he suffered a sad personal loss of the family, so he had to step down. And then David Cronenberg, who had done Scanners and The Dead Zone, stepped in and definitely put his stamp of body horror into this story. I do like it a lot more than the Vincent Price original. I think Jeff Goldman does a fantastic job. He should have gotten some kind of better recognition stature award-wise. This tragic story of a guy just falling apart at the seams, physically, as well as to a point mentally. Over a simple but sad accident. And the original fly was just the heads beat. It was a person with a fly head, and then it was a fly body with a person's head. But this, I thought, was much more effective. As you say, it's a take on cancer, someone falling apart, and perhaps even changing and falling apart. I love the music. I don't know what this music is from. Yeah, Brooks Films. That's uh, Mel Brooks, director of Blazing Saddles. He produced this film. But he called it Brooks Films, didn't put his name on it. He didn't put his, Mel Brooks didn't put his own name because he would be steered that people thought it was a comedy. He didn't want to detract from the film. But the film came out and was a success. Same time as Aliens and uh, all sorts of, uh, Big Trail Little China. Ah, uh, this is The Fly 2. Which, to be honest, I mean, you didn't need a sequel to The Fly. I don't like that they just kill off Gina Davis's character off. I'm sure if you worked around some stuff, maybe you could have gotten Gina Davis to come back. But it's still a fun sequel. And I think that's just the, the teaser. Eric Stoltz. It, it, the love story's not as strong, but it works better as a monster movie. The monster being a good guy... And attacking the bad guys at the end, stomp on people's heads. That's a satisfying finale with some really good gore. So. Ah, this is uh, Watchers. Watchers based on the Dean Koontz novel. Oh, by the way, I do like The Fly too, it's a decent sequel. But yeah, Watchers is a childhood favorite of mine. Like I said, based on a Dean Koontz novel, I actually got the film right here. Sally, there is no Blu-ray. Thankfully, the sequel got Blu-ray, but not the first one. Corey Haim, one of his times to get to be the star. He had done films like Silver Bullet and Lucas, but this is around the time when The Lost Boys came out, and sure, that came out in 87, so I'm sure he got this sort of capitalized on that success. I think it was the right choice to not show the creature that much because the up-close feature of the creature is not the best. So showing its point of view and even here just its arm I think was the right choice. Marker Ironside plays a very f sadistic villain. But he's always fairly good in, in movie roles like that. The creature has a tendency to f screw up people's eyeballs because it doesn't want to be seen. And I, this is my favorite Corey Haim role. I like the idea of the, the dog and the monster connection. 
I think as a kid, in a weird way, even though it's R-rated, this is a film that kids were more willing to maybe see because they could relate to someone like Corey Haim. Like, we live vicariously through them. And okay, the first film was exactly produced by Roger Corman. I know the sequels were, but... And sadly, that, that film is still st stuck on this VHS-looking, overpriced, out-of-print DVD. Watchers deserves a better release. Like, come on now. Let's get more... Let's get Watchers. Also, a great store Watchers has by uh, Goldsmith. God, Joel Goldsmith. Is this uh, Silver Bullet? Ah, yes, yeah, of course. Another Corey Haim film I was just talking about. Definitely my top five werewolf films. The werewolf doesn't look the best, to be fair. If the werewolf looked like, I don't know, the werewolf in Dodge Soldiers, or even the werewolf in The Howling, that would have been cool, but... What makes the film work is, I, I like the brother and sister... Uh, care... Uh, Corey Ham, he's this kid in a wheelchair, while this werewolf is killing people, one by one. And Corey Ham is able to find out who the killer is. And then later on, he talks to his uncle, Gary Busey. And he's like, oh, what the hell, that's ridiculous. But he does ultimately help these kids out. Gary Busey is a great plus for the film. He's a lot of fun as the uncle. Psycho of the Werewolf. I think at one point, the director of the Beastmaster, Don Castorelli, was going to be involved. And then something happened, and they got this other guy to direct it. But, yeah, along with Dodge Soldiers and the like, that's definitely my top five favorite werewolf films. Despite the werewolf not being the best looking. Ah, the first Critters. It's interesting for a film that's a bit more comedic with horror. It has the the trailer has the music from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, this trailer music, A Nightmare on Elm Street, because it's New Line Cinema. Of course, the director of this would go on to direct Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And for I understand, the original story was much more of a darker movie. Like, the original story that the writer had for this, the pitch, was that it was going to be much more of a bloody horror where some of the family members actually died. But then, despite what people think, this is not a ripoff of Gremlins. This story and strip was written before the release of Gremlins. It just... But that success definitely helped it get made. And in a way, this is kind of... Steven Spielberg at one point was going to do a film with Rick Baker called Nice Guys. And in a way, this is... We weren't able to see that film, but the closest you would get is this one. I think the Scott Grimes is good as the kid actor. I love the creatures by the Kyoto Brothers. I think they're wonderful designs. Uh, Critters 1 and 2, I think, are both good see good films. Ah, uh, Critters 2. Directed by Mick Garris. Who are going to direct The Stand, the 90s one, and Sleepwalkers. I'd probably say Critters 2 is my favorite. I do like Critters 1, but Critters 2... Because the Critters have been established, it goes at a bit of a faster pace... I like the Easter angle. I think with the Critter Age, it makes more sense. It was a good idea to have it take place on Easter. Uh, Scott Grimes returns as a little kid. He's much older. Scott Grimes would actually work on... I think he's on the Orville with Seth MacFarlane, and he's a voice on... Was it American Dad or, or something? I know he's worked with Seth MacFarlane quite a bit. I thought the Kyoto Bros had a lot more room to work with on the Critter effects. I love the Critter Ball at the, the finale. The crit, Again, they're able to do a bit more gags with the Critters. Again, this you see it, if you see the trailer, it balloon up and the one that gets his piece of his hair taken off. I love the Sheriff Club by Barry Corbin. You know, the line, This town to kiss my ass! Barry Corbin, who was in uh, War Games, among others. And DT2, yeah, David Toohey, the guy who would direct The Arrival with Charlie Sheen, was one of the writers on this. At least the original writer. Oh, this is uh, Ghoulies 2, I believe. Which is my favorite of the Ghoulies films. And, oh, I always... 
whenever people ask questions like this, I always forget. But if someone were to ask me, and if I remember, while this is leaving me, what's a sequel that did it better than the original? Ghoulies 2. Also, The Purge 2, Anarchy, other stuff. But I think Ghoulies 2 is a much better movie than Ghoulies 1. Ghoulies 1, it wasn't really about the Ghoulies. I mean, they were, I don't want to say a cameo, but they're barely in it. This, it's like, hey, give the audience what they want. Put the Ghoulies up front and center. They're the ones killing people. It's not like a huge body count, but there's definitely more at play. There's probably a bit of a bigger budget for the Ghoulies to have it more screen time. The amusement park setting was a nice touch. Made it a different venue. And of course people think it's part of the ride. And uh, of course Dooley in the toilet. Just like the poster of the first movie. Live up to that. Directed by Albert Band. Yeah, Dooley's 2 is a fun sequel. That's the first one I saw as a kid. Then I went back to see the first one. And went, This first one sucks. It's fucking boring. And I actually like Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College. As it's kind of a silly, fun Animal House ripoff, and then the Ghoulies at like the Three Stooges. It's fun comedy. It's not highbrow, but. But yeah, we're doing the Code of Clowns from Outer Space. Uh, very underrated film. Uh, funny enough, the, the guy who's the composer of this film, who did a wonderful job on the music, he sent me a friend invite on Facebook and from time to time he'll like a post or a comment I have v very kind very generous guy the the composer so I just love the creativity in Killer Clones from Outer Space I love like this here the the sh hand shadows and swallowing people John Vernon who is on the right there is the cop the sheriff He's been a lot of stuff. He was in this film called Blue Monkey. He was in Savage Streets saying the line, Go fucking iceberg. But I love the Kyoto Bros. Same guys who did the effects on Critters. They not only did the effects, but they directed the film. And there's tons of a sequel. Sally, I don't want it because I have a feeling... I think a lot of these films work in their 80s charm. And a lot of these films can only be done in the 80s. Because nowadays it'd be CGI. They just don't have the charm of these old school effects. And even the way the film is shot, it'd be filters and more digital. But you know, the ideas, like the, the pies are made of acid, so then you get some creepy ideas, like a guy being melted because of acid from these pies, and a straw being put into a cocoon of cotton candy and sucking the blood out. It's like, ew. But it still works as a great theme song as well. Ah, of course, Gremlins. Joe Dante film, who had done films like Piranha. But this put Joe Dante on the map. And to be honest, he never got back to the success of Gremlins. I mean, he did other fun films. Inner Space, The Burbs, even you know, Gremlins 2. But none of them were ever the equal of the first Gremlins. Zach Galladin, who would later be in Waxwork 1 and 2, and Gremlins 2. and He worked well. As this kid who, or this t teen in this very quaint town middle nowhere, there's Corey Feldman, who worked with Joe Dante again in The Burbs. See, this is a smart decision on the trailer to not show the creature. Yes, there are trailers in the 80s that showed everything, but you look at trailers like this. Like the trailer for Harry the Hendersons, I remember. They didn't show Harry. The, the Bigfoot himself. Here, you don't see a good look at Gizmo. You don't see a good look at the Gremlins. Because, no, we want you to see the film and find out for yourself. But nowadays, it's like, here's a picture of this. The movie's not out yet. Let's discuss the ending. Um, the movie's not even out yet. Yes, but we're going to discuss the ending. And here's some pictures, and here's this pictures. And this was a secret, but here's some scoops so we could get more money from you. But yeah, this film, a combination of stellar creature effects, that hometown, small town charm, competent direction, the cast, not only Zap, but Phoebe Cates and all worked well together. Jared Goldsmith, my favorite composer, may he rest in peace. 
Ah, the Terror Within. Kind of a take on Alien, but if Alien was in an underground bunker. It's directed by Terry Knotts, uh, the same guy who directed Watchers 2. And this also has the same monster being Watchers 2. Actually, if you watch the trailer, the trailer to Watchers 2 has the same build-up in music. You have George Kennedy there, who's in the airport films and Naked Gun films. The airport, the more serious airport. Not airplane, airport. But you know what? Yeah, this is not the most original film, but it's it served its purpose. And it did a decent enough job with its purpose. And what I mean by that is... The it was the setting was claustrophobic enough that creates some decent amount of suspense. Uh, the creature is not a bad design, and there's a lot of nice shadows and hidden through corridors to try to hide some of it. Uh, the actors do their jobs admirable. I, I like the lead guy, who would actually be a producer. He would go on to work on the Terror Within too. I read the trailer showing a bit of the, the good stuff here, but like that explosion, that's a good shot. It's a rainy night. Yeah, Andrew Stevens, the lead. It's a rainy night. You want to see a creature feature film? It's more than capable. It's a it's a decent flick. It might not be in my favorites, but it's a decent Ah, here we go. This is one of my favorites. Which yes I did hear that this is getting a 4K from Tino Lorber, which surprises the shit out of me. So not only did it, not only did it get a Blu-ray before Abyss, it got a 4K before the Abyss. I mean, this right here, Leviathan. One of my personal favorite films of all time. Without a doubt. Uh, this is a film I can watch any time and never get tired of it. As a combination of just seeing great talent, rooting for the underdog, because I think this film is criminally underrated, Wonderful cast. Peter Weller from Robocop. Richard Trenner from Rambo. First Blood Part 2. First Blood. Ernie Hudson from Ghostbusters. Daniel Stern who would be in Home Alone. All this other stuff in between. Beautiful score by Jerry Goldsmith. Uh, great set design by Bill Cobb. I like the practical effects by Stan Winston. They always get picked on. No, they're not. John Carver's the thing. But I do like the effects. I like the look of the film. This, I, I, this film will certainly look gorgeous in 4K. I look forward to it. It's a slow build, but I don't mind because I like the setting. It's a the set design, the music, and the cast of blue-collar characters who I enjoy being around even before the monster. And then the monster is an added bonus. And there's stuff like the great lines of dialogue. Like so, A lot of people ask me, what's that line from your old intro? You told me, Becky, one more time, six-pack. It's from this movie. Gone, bitch. We're still here. I love Leviathan, absolute classic. In my opinion. Oh, this is a uh, not Dead Space, but Deep Space. Dead Space is the video game, and a Mark Singer film. Deep Space. Uh, Deep Space. It's low budget. You do wish there was more action, more gore more creature feature stuff but for an ultra low budget film it's fun enough to watch it was great that I finally got a blu-ray to see it cleaned up because whenever you would watch it the scenes are just too dark part of the appeal is their lead being Charles Napier he played Murdoch for Rambo for Player Part 2 him getting to be the lead of the film was a great change of pace he was also lead in this film called The Night Stalker with uh, the maniac cop himself Robert Zadar is the bad guy I like the creature. I mean, the creature's derivative, but it's fun. Practical effects for, you know, it's 80s charm. It's not, again, high budget. I'm going monster hunting. And you, the alien, the, the creature by the end looks like if there was a teen alien. Kind of like Xenomorph here with a little bit of a spiked dome. And come on, you got your hero fighting the creature that looks like a punk rock version of a Xenomorph with a chainsaw and cuts it off with he cuts the fucking head off with a chainsaw that scene alone is worth the price of admission anytime you get a hero cut off uh, wannabe xenomorphs head off with a chainsaw 
it's worth a look. Deep Space. It's definitely the that director's best film. Ah, uh, yes, Aliens, which I have the poster right behind me. I, I guess this is the domestic trailer. Some would say there's a TV spot, but I'm guessing as the summer went along, this was probably put in the theaters like, hey, after seeing this film, go watch our film too. More and more can be said about Aliens. It's an absolute fucking classic. One of my favorite films of all time. Rock'em, Sock'em, badass movie. Speedy of Witch, you'd have Predator. Another Rock'em, Sock'em, badass movie. Arnold is pretty much, I saw Aliens with my buddy Jimmy Cameron. I want to do that movie. Well, we already did it. Well, this bullshit, to live it. I want to do another movie like this. Well, I mean, we got this movie. Is that an alien in it? Was that this alien? Okay. Yeah, just said we'll do it. It's like the Dirty Dozen versus an alien. I get to be the leader. My name is Dutch. Predator. I mean, look at the cast of badasses. Classes, store balance of vestry. Wonderful idea of the villain. Drawn to heat and conflict. Wonderful work by Stan Winston. Well played by Tim Peter Hall, who also did a good job playing him in Predator 2, which is the most underrated sequel out there. Love this film. And this music, I don't know what this music is from. This was used in a couple other movies, but I never knew what this music is from. Sometimes these trailers have music that look sound really cool, but never found out. It bit the raw man to hunt. Cole Weathers, Sonny Landham, Jesse Ventura. Time. It bit the raw man to hunt. Like, yeah. And Arnold was on a trajectory. I mean, he had Commando. He had, you know, the Conan films, Terminator. Then this film. He was on a trajectory of being, you know, the biggest action star at that time and this team on the summer was very successful I had the VHS tape wore it out so much that a lot of the cover was missing I remember that the trailers were a teaser for Revenge of the Nerds 2 and a film with Robert Downey Jr. called The Pickup Artist with him and Molly Ringwald those were the two trailers on the VHS of Predator that's how many times I saw that damn VHS because it's a uh, classic uh, Silent Rage. What if Michael Myers was defeated by Chuck Norris? This did come on Blu-ray, Sally with no features, but it's nice to see the film cleaned up a bit. Pretty much an experiment going awry, and Chuck Norris is here to play. Very spooky uh, musical score. Brian Libby here as your villain. And from the beginning, it's like, can't do it, Doc. I'm going to lose it. I'm losing it. And I know the makers of the film, they were more inspired by the Frankenstein type of you know medical monster, not really slasher films, but, you know, slasher films were a big part of it, but I think the makers of the film, they were more inspired by that kind of Frankenstein type of story. Chuck Doors must destroy him. Hey, if you don't have someone beat up a psycho villain, you better have Chuck Doors to do it. It was a great change of pace for Chuck Doors. It was variety. This in Hellbound, and even here on the Terror, the closest Chuck Doors came to horror. I love when action stars try to take a stab at horror. Stallone, ICU is the closest. Arnold, Predator. And, uh, uh, speaking of the, the hero and the terror. This one is a bit more dramatic and a thriller. There's not a lot of action. There's little bits of action. But again, it's Chuck Norris trying to expand. And I did variety. You know, people get mad when they don't do variety. And doesn't mean it's always going to be good. But this is more of a... 
uh, Billy Drago, may he rest in peace, playing a good guy this time. He was the bad guy in Delta Force 2, I believe, and a lot of other stuff, but he plays a good guy. But yeah, it's Chuck Norris going against Simon Moon, who would strangle and break people's necks, and he has a, you know, Chuck Norris is here, has a little bit of PTSD, because he faced his killer off in the past, and he lucked out and bring him in, but now he's escaped. It's kind of a Phantom of the Opera quality, because he's in this, like, theater, and the corridor's hidden in there, so it was cool to see Chuck Norris play that out, and Steve James from American Ninja 1 and 2, he's in this, but Sally underused. Uh, great score as well, which you hear in the trailer here. Canon film, the... Uh, bit underrated. I always enjoyed Hero in the Terror. Ah, uh, this is, uh... Would this really be horror? I mean, I guess it'd be thriller. I don't know if this would be a horror film. But I, I guess... I don't know, maybe. Thriller. But this is Charles Bronson's Ten to Midnight. They kind of give the, the ending away in the trailer, though. But yeah, Ten to Midnight... The sicko that likes to kill, mutilate women, at times doing it while Nate did. There's Lisa Albacher, who would be in Beverly Hills Cop, and Leviathan. Uh, one of Charles Bronson's better movies. I mean, my favorite is Death Wish 3, but other than that, it'd be The Evil Dead Men Do, Murphy's Law, and this one would be up there. Every day, it was nice to see, I bet you'd nice to see... Action heroes try to take part in this. I mean, it's about a serial killer and he's a bit of a fucked up individual, so there's a little bit of horror in there. Forgot that Wilford Brimley was in this, who was in Hard Target and John Carver's The Thing. I thought the guy who played the killer here did a pretty decent job portraying this guy who's not quite there. You have Andrew Stevens as this cop who was in The Terror Within. And the plot goes a little bit differently, because you have this guy that doesn't play by the rules and gets caught with it, and probably by the end of the film, his life, his career is definitely over. I won't spoil what happens for those who haven't seen it, but the trailer's guy kind of given the whole finale away, which is weird. Andrew C. Yeah, Jeffrey Lewis. Oh, yeah, J. Lee Thompson, who did a lot of films for Canon. He's a guy that could work well with Charles Bronson. He also did some Chuck Norris films between Firewalker, uh, I think Keen Solomon's Mines. Uh, we had Dino De Laurentiis. Manhunter. Uh, William Peterson, who will later be in CSI. And I would say this is my favorite film involving Hannibal Lecter character. I think Anthony Hopkins does a better job playing that role. But I'm talking about a movie that involves the character. This is my favorite. I do like Silence of the Lambs. But if, like, if someone's saying, which do you like this? Silence of the Lambs or Manhunter more? I say I like Manhunter more. I like the focus on William Peterson's character. I think this is much better than Red Dragon. I think Red Dragon is not good at all. I think the director here... Who also did the keep and you know Michael Mann really established a mood and atmosphere in this movie. His use of slow motion, pieces of music. Uh, I think he did a nice job adapting that story. The finale is tense. And I said Will William Pearson gave I thought captured more of that haunted, grim. Val but valid association having to deal with this crazy guy and then in Red Dragon. Red Dragon felt like a more sanitized version of the story. I'm like, why the fuck are we remaking? Oh, we're remaking it just to have Anthony Hopkins play Hannibal Lecter again. They probably could just call this Red Dragon. 
I mean, Manhunter, maybe people thought it's like a sequel to Man Eater. But uh, they don't just call it Red Dragon. But I guess they thought it was just. Red Dragon, they would think it was a fantasy movie. Ah, uh, Jat's back. I don't care what anyone says, this is an underrated film. James Spader does a fantastic job. I know the guys at Dead Pit don't like this film. I disagree entirely. I think this is a very interesting story. It's a nice take on the Jack the Ripper legend, but it's not really about that. It's more about... I don't want to give it away. I don't think this trailer sells the film as best as it could. It's a pretty decent psycho killer movie with a great... Because with Jets, it makes it seem like it's a slasher film and be a lot of gore. It's not. It's directed to Rowdy Harrington who would go on to direct Roadhouse. One of my favorite James Spader performances. He helps the film immensely. And I don't want to spoil Jets Bad if you haven't seen it, but it's a damn good film, in my opinion. Speaking of underrated, Razorback. Same God, the direct. We're going to direct Highlander. Among many other movies, Russell Mulcahy. One of the best movies to rip off, if you want to call it, the Jaws formula. Russell Mote, I think, brought a lot of style. I think this has really beautiful looking and stylish direction. The way certain shots are set up, the visual cues are brought up. I think the Razorback itself is a wonderful piece of effect done practically you don't see a lot of it it's hidden in the right way and the lighting the lighting is very it's completely underrated I never understood why this film got shit on idea if you like creature feature if you like films of the style of Jaws Razorback is easily worth a look starring Gregory Harrison uh, it does not deserve its poor reputation not at all. I mean, you can maybe get a Blu-ray overseas, but in the U.S., there's nothing for Razorback in the U.S. But thankfully, there is for this film, Alligator, which got a Blu-ray, which also had a 4K with it. And rest in peace, Robert Forster. Robert Forster does a wonderful job in this film. As a cop who, he's he's funny and he's easy to relate to. This guy who's losing a bit of his hair and there's a kind of a fun running joke about that. He's easy to root for. For the low budget, the way they handled the alligator effects, I think are commendable. There's some good visceral thrills. Guy didn't bit in half. Didn't take his limitations and utilize them fairly well. Hey, you did big fucking alligator in the city, and it gives you some of the bits of action and a bit of chaos and mayhem that you want to see in that type of film. I know Stephen King was a big fan of this movie, and that's one of the reasons why Stephen King tapped him to direct Cujo and then Cat's Eye, is because Stephen King was a big fan of this film. John Sayles writing the script definitely helped as well. It has that Larry Cohen flavor in the dialogue and script, even though Larry Cohen didn't write it. And that's because you have another talented guy, again, John Sayles, writing the film. But again, those films that people will say are creature featured, nature gone amok, inspired by Jaws, whatever you want to call it, this is definitely one of the best ones. This Henry Silva as the hunter, he would be the bad guy in both the Chuck Doris film Code of Silence and the Steven Seagal film Above the Law. It's kind of weird they give that away in the trailer. What happens. This trailer gives quite a bit away. <laughs> so yeah, there were some trailers that give a lot away. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some people want to... Sh it's because they want to show enough for people to show up and... whatever they tend to get people in the audience. Be a rest in peace, Robert Forster. My favorite role of his. Alligator 2, The Mutation. Now that sucks. They ain't worth spit. We have Warner Communications Company. The old Warner Brothers. 
Ah, yes, of a known origin. The film that Peter Weller and Joyce B. Charles Miles did before Leviathan. This was 1983, Diver Tate. Uh, Peter Weller is this kind of a... He's just a rich guy who's got this high project. He's worried about how his place looks and the material constructs and appliances. His wife and kid are on vacation. He's got the stress of this job going on. But there's this menace that seems mundane at first. This rat. And he's just you know, doing the basics. Gets an exterminator. Tries to catch itself. Mouse traps. And he just realizes this thing is just much more crazy than uh, it seems. And it's about a guy pretty much being driven crazy. And it becomes this war between him and this rat. As silly as that sounds, it's well photographed. Peter Weller does a fantastic job. The trailer, I think people thought maybe this would be a supernatural movie. Or like a ghost story movie. But uh, they didn't realize what kind of film it was. But very underrated film. Great flick, if you haven't seen it. Definitely recommend Of Unknown Origin. Uh, then you have uh, Cujo. The film Louis Teague did. Louis Teague did. Thanks to Stephen King and Joy and Alligator. And say, hey, you did that? Do this movie. And one of the few films Stephen King lights Of the adaptations on his work. He does say nice things about Cujo. Same with Stand By Me. Shawshank Redemption. Uh, there's a few others. I think the Dead Zone. D. Wallace, who is the mom in E.T., she was in Critters. As his mom, who, in a way, we're kind of not liking her too much because she's cheating on her husband. But we also see her go through this trial by fire, whether as if some kind of weird penance for what she did, whatever, but. You see her struggle, her fight to save her kid, keep her kid living and breathing and not suffocate. And the vicious attacks by this dog. The way they shot this, the way they handled the dog sequences. Very well done. I mean, you think of a simple idea. You're trapped in a car and this dog is trying to kill you. But they, they make it work fairly well. Cujo. And now forever, anytime you think of a bad dog, you think of Cujo. I didn't know Charles Bernstein did the music. He also did the music for A Nightmare on Elm Street. Of course, The Shining. The film Stephen, Stephen Teen hates. Because it was deviated from his book. But I saw his miniseries in 97. That miniseries sucked. But yeah, my favorite Stanley Kubrick film. My favorite Jack Nicholson film. I think it's brilliant, brilliantly directed. I think Stanley Kubrick definitely creates that atmosphere and mood with that hotel. The tracking shots. The beautiful cinematography. The eerie musical score. I think Jack Nicholson, he's a lot of fun as he gets more and more unhinged. I don't care for the Danny going. Yeah, Tony did a red rum, red rum. Like that got annoying after a bit, but I still quite liked it. It's interesting with this teaser that no other footage is shown. It's just, which in a way maybe that's what hurt it in the marketing because it didn't do that well at the box office. In fact, Friday the Thirteenth the same year kind of embarrassed it. But nowadays it's deemed kind of a classic. Not kind of, but it's deemed a classic. So on the one hand, I mean, it doesn't tell you anything about the story, but it's like, hey, this is the teaser. and The fact that they didn't come out with like another trail to show more footage for people to, you know, get more of an idea what the story is. Uh, another Stephen King adaptation, uh, The Dead Zone. Starring Christopher Walken. 
directed by David Cronenberg, and then later on we'll do the, the Fly remake. Definitely one of Christopher Walker's best performances. The ice is going to break. You also have Tom Steerett as the sheriff, and he was an alien in the 70s. But yeah, Christopher Walken does a wonderful job. You also have Martin Sheen as a guy who you, you don't want to trust to hit the button. you a tragic figure. This guy that meant well and had to do what he needed to do. And sadly, was that the best of endings? I know that later on there was a TV show with Anthony Michael Hall, which I actually remember liking the TV show. And they actually reference this idea of the movie where Anthony Michael Hall is going to shoot just like Christopher Walken does. Because that was the story, but then um, he has a buddy in the show and that's what helps him deviate from that path. See, all he needed is a friend. David Cronenberg brought some interesting visuals. The, the idea of the killer, there's a killer that he's chased after, and the kind of ritual suicide with the scissors. That was a, I don't think that was in the novel. I think that was a Cronenberg influence, and that was an interesting uh, idea to put in there. From Columbia Pictures. Ah, uh, Christine. So this is a this isn't a trailer. This is a fan trailer. Which I mean, the teaser is pretty much the car, and it revs up, and it goes towards the camera. This has a nice remix of the score, so that's cool to listen to. Of course, Arnie and his obsession with this car that is possessed by something evil. And almost like this weird love connection. John Stockwell is pretty awful. I think he's a terrible actor. He's very blasé and wooden and just not a great choice. I love the look of the car. I love that it can fix itself up and the way this handled with the reverse photography I think it's nicely done John Carper has that mood and feel with the use of his white screen with and of course his musical score Harry Dean Stan, who worked with John Carpenter on Steve from New York. <clears throat> this is a film that John Carpenter did after the thing flopped and he got fired from Firestarter. Which I'm guessing is why he took the job for to do the music for the new Firestarter is because he never got a chance to direct Firestar, so he never got a chance to do the music. And then he's like, well, this is what the music would sound like if a Firestar movie was made. But for I understand, that new Firestar sucks. I think even Christine's better than the other Firestarter. I mean, I love it as much as other people do, but I don't mind Christine. It's not my favorite John Carpenter film. Now this, on the other hand... <laughs> you do keep Christine, I'll take Maximum Overdrive, which Stephen King does the intro here. Using the music from Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. And that's, uh, was it Giancarlo? I forget, the, the guy who gets electric to the RK, he's actually gone to do some bigger films later on. I know this film was fueled by cocaine, but man, it's glorious. <laughs> I love the bazooka fun. I love the Green Goblin face on the truck. I love the ACDC soundtrack. I love the weird death scenes like Death by Soda Machine or Little Leaders getting run over by uh, some vehicles. Construction vehicles. Steamrolled, I should say. 
it's just a satisfying popcorn escapism movie. I love Master of Motor Drive. I don't care what anyone says. It's not a guilty pleasure for me. I sincerely love it. Yes, there's stuff that doesn't make sense. Like, why does the wedding couple's car never <laughs> come alive? No, it's not a film that's scary. But man, it's a fun ride. We're already in trouble. Adios, motherfucker. I don't know if it's true. I think this might be Kevin Peter Hall doing the voiceover. I could be wrong, but I think it is. I know he did some. The guy would be the Predator. He did some, and this might be one of them. But yeah, I love Maximum Overdrive. Still do. To this day. Very fun movie. Entertaining. Oh, we got Cat's Eye. <laughs> Excuse me. Underrated anthology film. This is an anthology film no one really talks about. You know, people always talk about Creep Show, which I like Creep Show, but it has this Tammy's of Cujo and then Christine here. From the same director of Cujo, Louis Teed. He did Cat's Eye. There's a reference to Pet Cemetery. She's reading that book. The Dead Zone. Watch on TV. You got Drew Barrymore, you got James Woods, you got Robert Hayes from Airplane, and Airplane 2, the sequel. And Dowager, which I liked all three stories. You had the James Woods first story, Smokers, Smokers Inc., and the more wild and wilder ways to keep him from not smoking. You have the second story, where Robert Hayes has to go around this ledge, you get some nice stunt work and pretty suspenseful scenes where Robert Hayes is this close to falling off that damn ledge as he's going around it. Does this crazy guy has a bet going. And then Drew Barrymore has this cast protector against this little troll thanks to help with Carlo Rambaldi. One of my favorite anthologies. Really enjoyed Cat's Eye. Five years ago, Stephen King, Creep Show. Oh, okay, so so he doesn't have Creep Show, but he's got Creep Show too. I mean, I like Creep Show more than Creep Show Two. I mean, Creep Show Two is okay. Chief Woodenhead, I don't mind. I like the guy who's one of the villains, who's like. This hair's gonna get me paid and laid. <laughs> I like that guy. I don't mind the effects of Chief Woodenhead. It's about these three people that kill George Kennedy's character and then this Chief Woodenhead gets revenge on them. The sense of story with the raft. The acting, the characters suck, but the effects on the, the raft creature itself, like the way the characters die, are pretty intense and visceral. That's probably some of the best effects in the movie. And then the third story, The Hitchhiker. Thanks for the Rye Lady. I could never get into. Just never really did anything for me. <clears throat> I think that's Tom Savini. They dub his voice, but he's the guy behind doing the things with the. behind in the truck waving his hands. That's Tom Zavini, but they redub his voice. And the raft, I mean, on the surface, it looks like just a giant garbage bag floating, but it's the damage that it can do. I guess for a creature to make it look as inconsequential as possible to then get his victims. I can't believe they give this away in the trailer. They give away the ending. I beat you. Like, at the end of the trailer, they give away the end of that story. That's that's so crazy. That's like a massive spoiler. Uh, Day of the Dead. Uh, my favorite is Dawn of the Dead, but Day of the Dead is pretty close. Rest in peace to Mr. R your Captain Rose himself. 
I'm running this Monty Farm Freddy style. I wonder what the fuck you're doing with my time. Excellent effects by Tom Zavini. Good cast. Has that stuffy claustrophobic feel so you get why these people are going a bit crazier uh, the more they're stuck down here in this gigantic tomb. It'll be one giant tombstone. Laurie Cardillo, I thought, served the story for rather well. George Romero wanted a bigger budget, but they said, we'll give it to you, if, but it has to be rated R, and he's like, I can't do that. So, it wasn't as big of a movie, but he did get it unrated, with all his gory glory. But yeah, this does have some fantastic makeup effects in it. Terry, I was a Terry Alexander, I believe, is him. They're getting these three actors who are in this movie and doing Night of the Living Dead Part 2. Like, those three actors. Why are you getting the actors of Day of the Dead to do Night of the Living Dead Part 2? I don't fucking know. Cheap ass bullshit. I'm like, okay. Well, the they can't get the. There's already a Day of the Dead 2 contagion. Well, we don't have the rights to do Day of the Dead 2, so. Yeah, but Day of the Dead, one of the better zombie movies. Ah, Fright Night. One of my all-time favorite vampire films. This in Front of Still Dawn. And then after it would be The Lost Boys and some others. But this in Front of Still Dawn are my two favorite vampire films. I thought William Ratsdale was very relatable as Charlie Brewster. You have a bit of that rear window quality where someone right next to you is doing nefarious things. But there's not much Sally to do about it. The director of this, Tom Holland, no, not the Spider-Man actor, but the director, Tom Holland, who would go on to direct Child's Play, which would have Chris Randon, who plays the villain here, he'd be in Child's Play, definitely knew what he was doing. Some very fun practical effects, a variety of vampire, vampiric activities, and Roddy McDowell is the shining gleam in this movie, as Peter Vincent, the fearless vampire killer. <laughs> Just such a great role for Roddy McDowell. I know a lot of people see him for Planet Apes. I see him as for Peter Vincent. And Brad Fidel, who did the score to The Terminator, doing the music for this. Ah, Friday Night Part 2. Okay, this has different music. I guess this is the original... I just, in the original trailer, it when theaters, it was this, Rescue Me. Because this was actually, I believe, on the trailer trauma, the 80s horror-thon I have. Because whenever you saw this trailer, it was in the midnight hour, which is in the movie. But in the midnight hour. But in the actual original trailer, it was Rescue Me. I'm guessing that wasn't used for later trailers because of the copyright to the song. But anyway, Friday Night Part 2... I think it's a worthy sequel. It's not as good as the first film. I wish Roddy Madawa had a bit more to do. I don't mind the, the girl they got for the... I love that monster in the elevator. The female vampire, her final form. I think that's a great look to it. I think when Razdale and Roddy Madawa worked well together. I wish we could have seen them more together though. Uh, the villains were fun. Yeah, this guy was... Kind of a vampire, but he's like a werewolf. He was the werewolf in the Monster Squad. Yeah, Brian Thompson as his bug eating vampire. It's a fun sequel. Sadly, because of the rights issues, it won't get a Blu ray in the US, which sucks. But, uh, is this Life Force? I think it's Life Force, Toby Hooper film. Yeah, I don't mind this. I think it has some really fun set design, like the inside of that ship and the some of the special effects. And you, you got a beautiful lady who's naked for a good chunk of the movie. <laughs> I think the acting for me, though, left a lot to be desired. I like this actor, but something about it, I don't know, just wasn't the... I don't know if it was the way he was directed or the lines he was given... 
He seemed a bit dry wooden compared to other movies I've seen him in. Like, I thought he did a lot better in Blue Monty, Steve Rail's Bat, than in this. Like, if he was the type of character he played in... By this... I don't know. I, I don't mind Life Force. That was a deal Toby Hooper had with Canon Films, even though it says TriStar. But Canon Films was a part of it. Because they wanted Tessie Chainsaw Master 2. As all okay, well, here's a three-picture deal. There's Life Force, there's Invaders from Mars, and Chainsaw Master 2. And none of them did well. <laughs> so then... Ah, the Lost Boys. I think this is a fan trailer, because I don't remember the original trailer having Cry Little Sister. But yeah, Corey Haim, Corey Philman, Jason Patrick. I would say this is Jason Patrick's best film. I'm not a big Jason Patrick fan. Nart is alright. Speed 2... I think it's one of the reasons for me that film doesn't work because Jason Patrick just I don't think he has a lot of charisma and he's rather dull in a lot of movies, but here he does fine. Of course he's playing up against you know, Tifa Sutherland, who's had a lot of fun as the villain. And then you got Corey Haim and Corey Feldman in there. Joel Schumacher directing, who would go on to direct phone booth and all sorts of stuff. Has a great soundtrack. Cry, little brother. Cry. Sleep all day, party all night. It's fun to be a vampire. Yeah, this is definitely a fan trailer. Not too bad. I don't know about this music. I don't know why they use this music in the trailer. And that just the other songs. Has a great soundtrack. Not just Try Little Sister, but other songs. Fun vampire movie. I mean, it would be my top five favorite vampire films, The Lost Boys. You know, people give Joel Schumacher so much crap for Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin is terrible, but he did a lot of good movies. Falling Down, Lost Boys, A Time to Kill. Uh, we got Near Dark. Near Dark I always thought was okay. I never loved Near Dark as much as other people did, though. But it's okay. I would say the stuff I like about it is the the bad guy, the, the villains, the, the family. I think that's my issue, is that Lance Hewitson and Bill Paxton and, yeah, Jeanette Goldstein, so a reunion from Aliens, like, they are more interesting to me than the two leads at this love story they have. Which then some DVDs try to make this look like a shitty version of Twilight. Well, this is way better than Twilight. But yeah, Bill Paxton made recipes. He definitely sh stole the show. Feed your licky good. Uh, directed by Catherine Bigelow, who would go do Blue Steel, The Hurt Locker. I mean, I wouldn't say, like, this actor, he's not bad, to be fair. He's not bad. What was it? Adrian Pastar or... It's just I find the villains much more interesting than the heroes. I find the villains much more fascinating. It's like I want to hang around with the villains more than the heroes. Like Bill Paxton. You do have some pretty good effects and, and gory moments. You've seen some of that in the trailer here. But I mean anytime you get Bill Paxton and Lance Emerson together, it's a good time. It's a pretty decent vampire film. But yeah, Lance and Bill Patsy definitely steal the show. I mean, I, I, yeah, Adrian Pastor, he does fine. I mean, I would put him above Jason Patrick. Because he has a bit more energy to him than Jason Patrick, but... So... I just... It's not really him, it's just the love story they shared. Eh... Yeah, Adrian Pastar, the love story, yeah, with him and Jenny Wright, I don't know, it's it's there. But I think the, yeah, the villains are a bit more interesting. Oh, Poltergeist. And of course, it starts out with a Steven Spielberg production, not Toby Hooper, 
But Steven Spielberg, I was talking Steven Spielberg. Uh, it's a big tragedy because like the older sister here she got killed because her boyfriend's a piece of shit that murdered her after this film was out then Heather Worth, this little girl in the making of Poltergeist 3 she died because they couldn't find some medical thing with her condition and they didn't find it in time she died from it I don't mind the sequel but this is definitely the best one I mean, Toby Hooper directed it, but a lot of people say that it's really Steven Spielberg. Something about Spielberg wanted to direct it, but then something about the director's guild, like he couldn't direct a certain amount of movies per year. I don't know what they did. Like, because there was E.T., because he was doing E.T., because that was 82. Like, Zelda Rubenstein said she only dealt with Steven Spielberg. And then there are other people who go, no, Toby Hooper did this. This is why you can't really get a good special edition of Poltergeist. Because you'd have to have people answering that question. If nothing's wrong, then what's the big deal? That means there's probably something else going on. People say, oh, Toby Hooper, there's some drug usage. I mean, it's sad that I kind of overtook the, the film itself. Because you never saw Toby Hooper do something with more finesse, technically, than this. Like he's much more gritty, like Tessie Chase a Master. This is much more of a it feels more Spielberg than Toby Hooper, although Oh what about these moments? We well, gotta think Spielberg also did Indian Jones Temple of Doom where a guy's heart gets ripped out. <laughs> but he's still alive, so And sometimes we me and like Mike supposed to be calling Steven Spielberg because what he did with Rick Baker where they were gonna do nice guys and then oh I wanna do something else and Rick Baker's like what? And then Spielberg got pissed, took all the drawings, and with a little bit of finesse in that creature Rick Baker designed became E.T. But then the uh, Carl Ramboldi like took all the credit in the Oscar. As I said, well, you know, if you puff those cheats out a bit, that E.T. creature kind of looks like one of the creatures I designed for nice guys. And Rick Baker even showed, it's like, imagine E.T. If you push the head this way and you switch the head down this way, it looks like fucking E.T., but. See, Steven Spielberg's name is getting bigger than Toby Hooper's name. It's a Steven Spielberg with Toby Hooper. But I mean, this happened before. It's like Willow, George Lucas. Oh, and it's directed by Ron Howard. Th that's not the first or last time that's happened. I mean, even uh, the relic from the producer of Aliens and. You know, Gail Ann Hurd. Oh, by the way, it's directed by Peter Himes. So it's, it's happened before in sense, but... But yeah, Poltergeist... Still a pretty solid film. Definitely one of the better ghost movies. Especially in the 80s. <clears throat> and of course, it was a huge hit, so you got a sequel. Which was a step down, but a hell of a lot better than Poltergeist 3. And this guy here is one of the good things about this. This old guy. Sadly, he was dying. What, I think cancer? Like, he was dying while making this. That's why he looks so ghastly. And he looks like death because he was knocked on death's doors. And sad to say. And he died quickly afterward. But he did the film because he wanted to leave a part of you know his acting for all to see. But he's definitely one of the big positives of the film. For the most part the cast other than the oldest sister that Sally passed away because of what I said. It was fun to see Trey Teal Nelson have a bit more to do in this. He goes a little journey and the finale is a bit special for Sporters Boy where they're in the spear world but Pretty else to get in the spear. It was nice to see him do something and help out. That was cool. Will Sampson, I liked. Sally, he passed away. Uh, I forget how many years after this he did, but Will Sampson was good in it. I love some of the creature work. Love some of the creature work in Poltergeist 2. Ah, uh, Pulse. For some reason, the actual official trailer is nowhere to be found. Maybe you can find a TV spot, so there's this is a fan trailer. 
But the guy, you know, whoever did the fan trailer, because I've used it too, they did a good job is using music from the movie. Polls came out in 1988, give or take. That is, I believe, a very young Joey Lawrence. And his brother Matthew Lawrence is in the film too. It's about this weird electrical pulse signal from where we don't know. But that's the case where I think the mystery is fine. Just how are you going to explain it? No matter how you explain it, it's going to come off as silly. So I thought in this case, the mystery of it actually worked in its favor. I thought for its budget, I actually thought the characters worked well within the, the story. Like the stepmom, I think... Do I want to spoil that? Well, she actually does start believing in the kid, and it makes you root for her more. No one's being a complete asshole. But the dad, understandably, is being a bit, huh, what, really? But the stepmom's like, well, you know, there's some weird stuff going on. Girls on a leap of faith. That was nice to see. It wasn't just the kid's all on its own. This uh, microscope, there's this certain type of photography, I forget what it's called was very microscopic in nature. I thought that was a nice detail. Some nice style to it. Um, and I don't know. I just like the general idea. Like what if one day you're... We're so dependent on power. Now great. I don't know why that makes the shower closed. <laughs> I mean the shower door is not powered up. So I don't know why that makes the shower closed. I don't know why you would start watch. You would just keep watching a piece of glass going to the garbage. Just get the fuck out of there. But this is a film that no one talks about. But I think is a, a bit of an underrated gem. I think it's pretty decent. It's it has got some good style, some capable acting. I, yeah, I like the premise. The ultimate shocker. I for a director of the didn't do much afterward. I thought he did a nice enough job. He deserved at least another shot, but Sally's film didn't do anything. Came out on Blu-ray, no feature, Sally. I did not even like a full trailer. <laughs> like, what was the trailer? I mean, it, did, it said I had nothing that came out on that Blu-ray. But yeah, Pulse, I think, is, is definitely worth a look. One of the more underrated films. Was oh, this the date? Yeah, this is the date. Starring a very, very young Stephen Dorff. Yes, the man who would be the bad guy in the first Blade film. He. I don't know why he never talks about this, just to be honest, this is one of his better movies. Compared to some of the other stuff he's done, like Alone in the Dark with Uva Bowl. But I don't know why he never talks about this film. It's a good cult creature feature flick. There's a lot of creativity and ingenuity based on the low budget. Pretty much they find this hole in their backyard. And because of certain circumstances, it seems like it's the gate to hell. And so when you get to the set you have the film, these kids, Stephen Dorff's sister, her friends, they're all in this house together. And all this crazy shit starts happening where the creativity just flies. And that's the thing is that even though they had a limited budget, they still didn't stop their creativity from flowing. That's what happens with a lot of these 80s films. I think that's why one of the many reasons why 80s films get thought of so much is that this charm and creativity and gun ho attitude flourished. Like these little critters, I don't know what you call them, these little demon things, and the arm falls in terms of these little magics that run back in. And again, all this other crazy shit that's happening in this house. The day two is awful. Like, don't. The day two is such as bit stepped out. And honestly, this director, he never really did anything worth a shit after this. Now, this guy with the glasses, this kid didn't do a whole lot. He was in the gate, too. But see, like, again, all this creativity. 
But see, unlike, say, Spooties, this actually has a follow-through story. The date. I love that old poster with the, the eyes and the hands coming out. Louis Tripp, he was in the second film. But Tibor Tatis, he never really did it, directed anything worth a shit again. Ah, uh, Evil Dead 2. My favorite Evil Dead film. I love all three Evil Dead films, but this is my favorite. Because they couldn't get some of the rights of Evil Dead 1, they couldn't use the footage. I remember someone saying they were going to try to reshoot some of the footage. But they just didn't have the budget for it, so... It, if To people, it seems like a remake, but after, like, ten minutes in, it's it's a sequel. It just... A lot of flourish and energy. I would love to check this out on 4K. Sorry, and see what it looks like. I think Bruce Tambo is his best performance as the Ash character. I, mean, I love his performance in... Uh, Army of Darkness, but this is an Ash where he's getting to be that badass, but he's still taking things seriously. Although I do love his performance, Army of Darkness. But this had the humor, action, horror combination, I think was the best blend in this one. Swallow this. <laughs> Just so much of a satisfying watch. Again, what you can do with a low budget, let the creativity flow. A House, directed by Steve Miner, who did Friday the 13th Part 2 and 3, starring William Catt, who is on the TV show The Greatest American Hero, and also you have George Wendt, who is on the TV show Cheers. Uh, one of the writers was actually the, the guy who go on the direct Night of the Creeps and Monster Squad. He wrote this. I think he envisioned much more of a serious story. But then, again, with a little bit of twist, it's, it's, thanks to Steve Meyer and others, it's a bit more comedic. But yet again, to beat the same drum, the creativity just flows. Like, okay, you're trapped in this house. Well, he's not trapped, but he's in this house trying to search for what might be the lead to his son who disappeared long ago. And like these weird creatures and dimensions and... Even though you're in one location, you can still let the ingenuity fly. I didn't like the bathroom window that's a portal to somewhere. And nice little heartwarming ending. Some very funny bits. A story by Fred Decker, I should say. He came up with the story and then someone else wrote the film. And yeah, Sean S. Tony and produced it. But yeah, I love the, these creature effects. Uh, but now you got House 2, the second story. Now House 2 is definitely much more of a comedic movie. I say it's definitely more child friendly. Uh, but I still think it's a fun sequel. I like House more. But House 2 is a fun movie. Again, it is created with the, the makeup effects, the different variety of creatures. The Gramps there, that's Royal Dano. He had a bit role in Killer uh, Clarence from Our Space. He also had a role in Ghoulies 2. I thought these two worked rather well together. The one guy he would go on to direct he would go on to be in Fright Night. He was a guy who was a second hand uh, Chris Randis character. Uh, the other guy I've seen him in other stuff before. I think he was in a Jeff Speepman like mind space movie, I forget what it is. But House Two it is a fun sequel, now as good as the first one. Yep, and this is House the horror show, or known in other places, House Three. I would say here is known as the horror show, but overseas is known as House 3, even though it has nothing to do with House 1 or 2. But yeah, this one, if you want 
the bit more of the unrated version, you need to get the Blu-ray from overseas. Because the Blu-ray in Stream Factory is more cut version. I mean, this it's a little extended overseas, but still, it's it was worth it. And that's the version I have. Lance Harrison, I think, is one of his more underrated roles. A cop that's very easy to root for. It's great to see Lance as the hero. Because he didn't get to play the lead hero a lot in movies. And Brian James is having fun. I've heard that this was his favorite role to play, or at least one of his favorite roles. And, you know, as mentioned, people like Freddy and Jason, obviously they were hoping this would become a franchise, but it never did. And this is around at the same time you also had Shocker. You know, these killers that come back from the dead. You also had... Uh, I forget what it's called. But yeah, I like the horror show. Rest in peace, Jim Isaac, who were going to dread Jason X. Sally, he has passed away, which is too bad. But uh, the horror show is a fun one. I do like Shocker more. But yeah, speaking of which, Shocker, yeah. I do like Shocker more, but I do like the horror show. But Shocker, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Yes, Wes Craven, who did, well, I mentioned there, Nightmare on Elm Street, Serpent and the Rainbow. Pretty much by this time, Wes Craven had gone away from Nightmare on Elm Street, and he wanted to do you know, films on his own. But he couldn't really get much of the money and merchandise of Nightmare on Elm Street, so I think this was him hoping to start a new franchise. Like, hey, I did it once with Nightmare on Elm Street, maybe I'll do it again, only I have more control. But this film didn't do anything. People say it was just a ripoff of Nightmare on Elm Street. Because it's about a killer who's dead and he comes back and you have dreams, visions. But I love the. T I think Peter Berg is very likable. Of course, he would go on to be a director and he acted in films like Copland. I love Mitch Pileggi, who would later be director Skinner on The X Files. I think he's a lot of fun. That's the way it is. I, I love Shocker. I love the Rock and Roll soundtrack. Sword and Stone. Among other songs. It's my personal favorite West Craven film. A lot of people give a shit. I think it's a lot of fun. I love the finale. Going through all the different TV channels. I think that's a very inventive finale. People always harp on the special effects. But compared to other effects in other movies at this time. I am didn't really bother me like it did other people. I thought with the whole TV static thing, it worked for what it needed to do. It definitely has a sense of humor. And I think that was rather funny on purpose. But yeah, I love Shocker. It just... Yeah, it doesn't get the respect it deserves. I, I think... The nice little love story... It was refreshing to see a guy as the lead in this type of film. Because the typical is that it would be just a female in this slasher film. But it was nice to see the, the guy be a lead. And then you find out the tension between Peter Berg and Mitch Pileggi's character. And Mitch Pileggi was just having a lot of fun. You know, biting fingers off of guards. Other stuff like that. The movie store. This, this, oh yeah, this is the other. Although I think this came out a year before, a uh, destroyer. Another movie about a killer who's electrocuted and comes back to life. Only oh, this has Clayton Roner, who would be in April Fool's Day, just one of the guys. I liked him in the movie. I wish he had more to do though. There's one. It's weird, Anthony Perkins is in this film, but he's nowhere in the trailer. So it's weird, like, they got Anthony Perkins, but they don't showcase him at all for advertisement. And yeah, you have, uh, I believe, uh, Deborah Foreman. And they had Deborah Foreman play a role work on April Fool's Day, among other stuff. Yeah, that jackhammer thing. Destroyer, it's okay for what it is. Uh, Lao Alzado is your villain. It's okay for what it is, but I definitely put Horror Show and then Shocker above it. Give me a B. Give me a B. Ah, uh, Child's Play. 
which is actually getting a 4K and Child's Play 2 and 3 are getting a collector's edition, but I think it's only 4K. Because Stream Factory announces there's a collector's edition now of them, but they only said it's 4K. So, I don't know if there'll be a blur with it. If so, I hate when studios do that, when they force you to try to get the other next one to get these features or get this. There's always bullshit when companies do that. They did that with DVD to Blu-ray. Now they're doing it from Blu-ray to 4K. Like, Trade to Part 2. There's a 4K of that with a Tom de Ralph Macchio. Which I can't find because I don't want all three films on 4K. I just want Cry to Part 2. But they're not selling it by itself. They're selling it with the three pack. Same with... Seems like they're going to do a Child's Play. I think it's going to come out in August. By the way, uh... Fuck's... I wonder if it's one of those deals that Universal made. It's like, okay, we released a Blu-ray Stream Factory. If you want these, it can only be 4K. So I, maybe it's not Stream Factory's fault. Maybe it's Universal's fault. Going, if you want this, fine, but it can only be 4K. So it probably is Universal's fault. Because Stream Factory wanted the Child's Play films before, and Universal said no. Hey, you want the 4K? Sure. So now, so I, I'm guessing more of the blame is Universal. What a deal was. But I'm sorry, I mean, this is a classic film. I mean, I love the Chucky character, well voiced by Brad Dourif. Catherine Hicks, wonderful as the mom. The kid, Alex Vincent, is a much better kid actor than adult actors. Is an adult actor who's boring as shit. Uh, Child's Play is a classic. I mean, what more can be said? Sorry, I was talking about that news more. New Line Cinema. Is this a Nightmare on Elm Street, or is this. Yep. Nightmare on Elm Street, so we're going to begin just to some Elm Street films. The original. <clears throat> Johnny Depp. Funny enough, with the whole trial going on, there's Johnny Depp. Always funny that when this film came out, you also had Dreamscape before it, and Dreamscape was another film about dreams and nightmares, and a guy with like fin <laughs> knives on his fingers. Or that's what it looks like. West Raven must have saw that and said, Oh shit. Rest in peace, John Saxon. Rest in peace, West Craven. I mean, this movie's a classic. What more to be said? Sorry about my burping. I know there's a deleted scene. I saw it once where... You find out Nancy had a brother or a sister... Who was killed by Freddy Krueger. And something about. I guess she didn't remember. or like the, It's the scene where the mom has the glove. And they're by the boiler. And she's talking to Nancy. And say that Nancy uh, you had a brother. Sister. It was one of them. And that's why you know, they were one of the parents. That helped kill Freddy. I always thought that was an interesting note. That no one really brings up anymore. I mean, it wasn't in the film, but like that's an important detail that was cut out for the final version. And I love the movie, but that ending with the mom looked like a Barbie doll going through the dam. This door is still silly. And that was Robert Shea's fault, because he wanted that. Wes Craven's version of the ending was much better. But here we got Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Not nearly as bad as people make it out to be. I like that it tried to do something different. That's not Robert England in the shower, because they thought, we don't need Robert England. That's why this Freddy looks like he shit his pants walking. So yeah, the Freddy in the shower scene is not Robert England. And they realize, this guy looks like he shit his pants. That's how he's walking. So get Robert England. Mark Patton did a great job. To be, I mean, one of my favorite lines, you've got the body. You've got the body. I've got the brain. Dark Freddy is still dark as hell in this. Scary as hell. I think it's my favorite score from Elm Street films by Christopher Young, who would do the Hellraiser music. I think Mark Patton does a nice emotional performance as this guy who's being used by this killer. I don't mind this because, oh, Freddy is so short. Who gives a shit? He's got a fucking claw that will claw your face and rip your guts out. I'm still in that mess with him. Don't mess with an animal this big, but it's like... Yeah, I don't want to mess with that. And yeah, Jack Shoulder would want to direct the hidden. 
Underrated sequel, Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Underrated sequel. I go back and forth which I like more, the first one or the second one. Because the second one I don't think is as bad as people make it out to be. Uh, we have Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. I think for most people they would say this is their favorite, which is a good choice. Great characters like Kincaid, Patricia Arquette's character, you got Joey, Nancy Allen coming back. I know there's some people like, well, how do you, how come you like Elm Street 4? Because they kill off the Dream Warriors. Well, Elm Street 3 kill off Nancy and they kill off uh, John Saxon's character. <laughs> so Elm Street 3 did it first. Elm Street 3 killed off the characters from the first film. And then Elm Street 4 kind of did the same for Elm Street 3. But I love the, the song Dream Warriors by Dawkins. Freddy gets a bit more of a sense of humor. Welcome to the prime time, bitch. Uh, this is teasers. They don't really do this kind of teaser anymore where they shoot footage just for the teaser. Uh, this is not in the film. It's specifically for the teaser. And this is when Freddy was getting up in popularity. Like Each film was making more and more money because it's a slasher film, but you have the creativity and special effects you can put with the dream sequences so it becomes more of a spectacle for people to be wild about. And then we get to Elm Street 4, which is my personal favorite. Directed by Rennie Harlan, who also had done Prison at this time. The movie Prison. He didn't go to prison. And uh, I love Lisa Wilcox's Alice. Alice is the character I can relate to more, because when I was a kid, I was shy and quiet, would daydream a lot. So I related to her. So I kind of lived vicariously through her. You know, someone who did more... Stand up for herself and more powerful as the movie went along. I love... Anytime when I had my intro, the music used is from this movie. So many times I've had people ask me in that... I used to have an intro in my front of my videos. If you go back to like a year ago with my videos, it's still in there. But what's that music from? It's this. When Alice is getting right in front of the mirror, and she's gearing up for war, for battle... I just think this is called the MTV Freddy, the the way it looks, the cinematography, the energy Randy Harlan brought to it. That death, the, the stream mad George cockroach bit, is still my favorite death in the franchise. And again, I, it's, I love the direction, it's my favorite character in the franchise, it's my favorite music, you know, heard in front of the mirror of the franchise, my favorite death in the franchise, the, the cockroach scene. Uh, I love Elm Street 4. I noticed you did not put the first Friday the 13th, which I don't blame you, because now we're at Friday the 13th. I, I, I can understand. I like Friday the 13th, but it's not a favorite of mine. It's, like, if I write them, well, I've done that before, but I don't mind Friday the 13th, but it's actually very low on the list, ranking them. I do think Friday the 13th Part 2 is much better. Jason, even with the, the mask, I buy more than 85-year-old uh, grandma who could somehow pick up people and hang them on with a fucking arrow on a door, which is Harry Crosby. And then we got, you know, Friday 3 Part 3 in 3D. We got the, the hockey mask. And of course, everyone was take credit who came up with the hockey mask. And this was a huge hit because it helped with the 3D. I'm not big on the lead actress in Part 3, but I still think it's a fun film. Uh, and then we got part four, the final chapter, which it wasn't final. Directed by Joseph Zito, who direct Missy in Action, Invasion USA, Red Scorpion. Got Crispin Glover and his goofy dancing. The computer says you're dead fuck. The computer don't lie. Fun sequel. It's not the final chapter. They thought it would be, but it made too much money. So they kept going. Oh, part five's on here. I don't mind part five. Is that J? That's funny. People are fine with this film, but it's not Jason. But then they get mad at Jason goes to hell. Well, this is not Jason. Well, technically, that's more Jason than this. That has more Jason than this has Jason, <laughs> technically. But people give this a pass. But I like the film. I don't care for the ending because I guess it's like a dream scene because they don't follow up on it. Uh, the core, the door is really cut down. 
really cut down because the MPA were being dickheads, but it's not a lot of nudity. Rest in peace to the director because he did Savage Streets um, and as well as Friday 30 Part 5. But yeah, I still have some fun. This is one of my favorite parts since Jason Lives. I love the look of Zombie Jason. I thought C.J. Graham did a nice job portraying him. I like the Universal Monster type of aesthetic that was it Tom McLaughlin did. It got He's Bat the Man the Man Behind the Mask, which I love that song. Some good death scenes. Someone gets their heart punched out. The the woman that gets her head into the wall and you see the concave. The it pushed the wall <laughs> make a figure of it. Got some fun lines of dialogue. Where the red dot goes, ya bang. And the, the cast do their jobs well, especially the our two lead characters. Come on, Magic Head! I thought he was the best Tommy Jarvis. Yeah, this is a fan version. Just that the teaser is cool teaser, but it's an empty cemetery. The coffin pops up, it opens, and then there's no one in there. And it shows that you know, Jason is coming. I've seen this fan trailer before, though. Kind of done like you would with the Friday 30 reboot. I think what they call it, like, modern-style trailers. And, you know, this Tony Goldwyn would be in the Patrick Swayze film Ghost. But, yeah, I like the sense of humor in this, too. Like, Part 6, I think, is definitely one of the best ones in the franchise. Does it feel like I have... Yeah. Ah, yes. One of my favorites. Laura Park Lincoln. Terry vs. Jason. I love the look of Jason. It's my favorite look. I think Kane Howard played it exceptionally well. Good by John Carl Beekler. I have the uncut version. So I watched the uncut version. So I can't complain about the gore because that's not the... I don't watch the cut version. I watch the uncut recut where it looks like a VHS and put, someone put all the deletes... The, the, Gore back in, and there's music, and it works well. So I get to see the uncut version anytime I want. And well, it's a VHS, so uh, they're Friday 13th, they're not Blade Runner. It, I think it actually works. A uh, Hellraiser. I'm actually surprised I didn't know Effrey liked the first Hellraiser. I don't know why. I know I like the second one. I I just because I never hear him talk about Hellraiser. I just really it never came up Hellraiser. Probably in the slasher cast, but that's been so long I can't remember what we said. But I like the the first Hellraiser. Hellbound Hellraiser Two is my favorite. Um, it's definitely got some really creepy visuals thanks to the Ty Barker. I remember when I first saw this, I only saw the ending of the film. I don't know why, it was so weird. It was like some VHS tape, but something about it, it only had the ending. Like her escaping, and then the, the hobo flying to the sky. So for the longest time, I, that was all I knew about Hellraiser. But definitely a very... You know, creepy, horrific movie, Hellraiser. And really, you only needed three movies at most. Uh, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Done in a year where there was a lot of good horror sequels. 1988, because you had Elm Street 4, you had Friday 30 Part 7, you had Phantasm 2, you had... Hellraiser 2, you had Fright Night 2. 1988 was a lot of sequels, but a lot of good sequels. Unlike 89, where the next year you had Friday 13 Part 8, Elm Street 5, Halloween 5, a lot of dog shit. Oh, Halloween 4, that was also. So then, Halloween 4, Hellbound Hellraiser 2, Fright Night 2, Phantasm 2, Elm Street 4, Friday 13 Part 7. You could argue that's the best year for horror sequels. For how consistently good they are. 
But I liked this one the most because it upped the ante of the first. Like the beginning feels like similar because instead of Frank, it's her. Julia, yeah. It's her doing it. No skin, gets more skin. But then it ups the ante with being in this hellscape. It gives Kirsty a bit more to do. Gives Ashley Lawrence a bit more of a protector quality. Helping this younger teen. Gives a bit more momentum. And it was nice to see a bit more of the creativity in the, the hellscape. And they got rid of Pettis, so they must have thought this would be the, the last one. Until the 90s, and yeah, Hellraiser 3. Well, I'll tell you, that pillar comes back, and then but then the hope is like... Anyway, it's a good sequel. A choppy Mall. Very fun movie. Yes, I know, why the fuck would you have these high-tech security robots for a fucking mall? It'd be so damn expensive to run these robots, it wouldn't be worth it. But, it's a fun idea. Uh, Jim Wynorski, I was it's the best film he's made. Oh man, they gave away the head explosion in this? That's like the best gore in the movie. Yeah, this is a lot of fun, Choppy Mall. Uh, the cover was weird because it's not really the robot on the cover. And it looks like a... It doesn't look like the movie. Uh, like, the the cover... It's like a Terminator type of hand. It's weird, but... Uh, Choppy Mall is a, a very fun film. And I keep saying that a lot because 80s were about fun. But this is Psycho 2, I believe. As we're referencing the first Psycho. Showing that it was you know, in black and white. And pretty much going to tell the audience how we're entering this new world. You know, remember the, the visceralness of the original movie. Uh, Psycho 2 is my favorite of all the Psycho films. And I gotta say, the director who did Road Games. Very underrated film. It was so ballsy for him to take up the mantle to do a sequel to Psycho. Just people going, what the fuck? You're going to do a sequel to an Alfred Hitchcock movie? Kind like Peter Hyams, who, when he did 2010. Wait, you don't do a sequel to a Stanley Kubrick movie? But Anthony Perkins did a wonderful job, and you felt sorry for the character. Like, he really wanted to go on the straight and narrow path. But he was being pushed around by these assholes that wouldn't let him go. And it's like, you know what, if they did let him go, maybe he actually would have been fine, and maybe they actually, he would have been fine, and these assholes pushed him over the edge. But, uh, Psycho 3, I don't know. It's there. This is the one Anthony Perkins actually directed himself. I don't know, I guess this one, I thought, didn't really bring enough new to the table. It felt like, uh, I mean... <laughs> this music sounds familiar. I swear I've heard this music before. Yeah, it's like Jaws 3. And this is music from Jaws 3. <laughs> I just, you know, for Psycho 3. I mean, I don't know. I don't really have a big impression on Psycho 3. Yeah, I thought it was kind of like unneeded. I thought it was fairly unneeded sequel. I, I didn't think it just, it didn't really add enough to the table, in my opinion. So I'm not really big on Psycho 3. But teach their own. I am a big fan of this one though. Halloween 2. My favorite Halloween film. From 1981. More of the night he came home. I love the hospital setting. Yes I don't know why there's only 10 people at the hospital. It's a slow ass night. I don't know what to tell you. I just say fix that in Halloween Kills. Where there's a shitload. Of, the whole fucking town's in the hospital. <laughs> 
It's funny they have a different voice for this guy. I've been treated, 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 treated to death tonight. Like in the trailer, the voice is different from the guy in the movie. <clears throat> I know Jay Lee Curtis doesn't have much to do, but she did. She had less to do in Halloween Kills. Because in this one, at least she shoots Michael Myers in the eyes. At least she does that. She didn't do shit in Halloween Kills. And plus, you got Donald Pleasance. I had one guy get pissed at me going, How the fuck did you... Uh, I was talking about Tommy Doyle. How the fuck did you say Anthony Michael's Tommy Doyle is worse than the Tommy Doyle in Part 6? That's bullshit, man. I'm thinking... I don't like Halloween 6, but Tommy Doyle actually beat the shit out of Michael Myers. As stupid as it was. Tommy Doyle in Halloween Kills, he riled up a bunch of people for them to get fucking killed. So he led them to their deaths of stupidity. And then he was stupid too. And then he stupidly got his ass killed because he's a fucking moron. So sad to say, yeah, they respected Tommy Doyle more. And Park Six, no matter how many goofy looks Paul Rudd gave, he still didn't get anyone killed. He saved a baby, rescued it, and he beat the shell of Michael Myers and uh, lived. So sorry, I mean, Halloween 2 is a classic. I mean, sorry, I got on the trap, but it's like, yeah, I hate to say it, Halloween 6 sucks, but Tommy Doyle had more to do than fucking. Anyway, but yeah, Halloween 2. I love the hospital setting. They amped up the kills. I thought Michael Myers, the actor that played him, I thought did a great job. I like the way the mask looks in this. The store, very well done. Same mood, but wasn't just a carbon copy. Pretty decent TV spot. I like the, the lightning hits in it. But yeah, Halloween 2... Doesn't deserve the hated yet. <clears throat> prom night. I'm I'm not really a big fan of prom night. It's it's there. It's not one of my favorite slasher films. It's not. I much prefer Terror Train, April Fool's Day, My Bloody Valentine, a lot of the Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, Halloween films. I'm prom night is average at best. First off, I think they used Lizzie Nielsen a bit too weirdly because technically his father, the, he's the father of a character who's very important at the end of the film, but he's nowhere to be found. Where he disappeared to, no one know, you think that would be more important. Number two, the killer's outfit is pretty lazy and blasé, it's just black, there's nothing to it. And because of the story, Jamie Lee Curtis is never in jeopardy. Like, your lead character is never in jeopardy because of who the... You know, I don't know if I want to spoil that, but... Like, there's a reason why Jamie Lee Curtis' character is never in jeopardy. So when your lead character is never in trouble or jeopardy or anything, that kind of hurts the, the film. I didn't like, where's Lazy Neil set the, I just, and the gore, it's not like a wildly gory movie. This film I liked a lot more, Terror Train. This was more my cup of tea. If I exclude franchises, like, don't put Halloween, Friday the 13th, Elm Street in the, in the list. Like, single horror slasher films. This would be in my top five favorite 80 slashers. Like April Fool's Day, My Blade Valentine would be on there. This would be on there. I love the idea of a slasher film on a train. It makes it seem a bit unique and different. I think it's competently directed. Same guy would go on the direct. What? Stop or my mind will shoot. Which I know is strange. <laughs> uh, he directed... They didn't do a... God, Roger Spottiswood is his name. Then he did Air America, I believe. And... Did he do an Arnold Schwarzenegger film? See, so, yeah, I'm bad with names. I'm bad with stuff, but... 
I love the idea of the killer keeps changing costumes, so you can never get a bead on who he can be. Uh, this guy was the worked the conductor. I thought he worked well. He's kind of like a Donald Pleasance type of presence. Hart Bodner played a good dickhead, which he would later be a good dickhead and die hard as Ellis. Hans Bubby, I'm your white knight. But see, you did the party aspect of prom night, but it's on a train, so it makes it a unique environment. But again, the killer, different costumes, and you get to have an actual fight and battle at the end. Some pretty nice stuff where she puts herself in this cage type of thing and battling back and forth through the wiry work of this cage. Ben Johnson as a conductor, he was a likable character. But again, this is like an intense finale. You have an appearance by David Copperfield. Yeah, this cage thing uh, I was mentioning, this right here. Well, you saw it briefly, she lost herself in. It's not a wildly gory film, to be honest, but I thought it has enough other good aspects to more than make up for that. Uh, I, mean, I quite enjoy Terror Train. So I think it's definitely one of the better slashers of that time. Uh, of course, Road Games. Love Road Games. I still... I have the Overseas Blu-ray, but I do want to get the Scream Factory Blu-ray. Just for the fact of, you know, not having to deal with the region free in order to, to watch it, because I love road games so much. Jamie Lee Curtis has a supporting role, but she works well with Stacey Teach. Pretty much real window, but in a moving vehicle. From the same director that worked on Cycle 2. I thought these two worked so well together. Stacey Teach was so likable. I... The Australian Outback was well utilized. And look at the way this is lit. I mean, it's... That bathroom looks like just a beacon of heaven. As you get ready for hell. I don't quite Tarantino is a fan of this film. He's taught... Jamie Lee Curtis, it seems like she doesn't like anything unless it's fucking... Halloween or A Fish Called Wanda. Or Trading Places. Otherwise, everything else sucks. Because she shits on The Fog, shits on Halloween 2, shits on this movie. I'm like, they're better than anything you've done the past ten fucking years. They're better than the shit you're doing now. Which I'm sure in five years you'll call it shit. <laughs> or ten years. Give it ten years then she'll say it's shitty. But this, I mean, you yeah, have some nice Hitchcock style visual touches. I guess Stacey Keach is a very likable character. I mean, this is a film that, uh, underrated movie, underrated gem. Richard Franklin did a wonderful job. That's the guy who directed Cycle 2 and among others. Ah, yes. One of my personal favorites, The Hitcher. C. Thomas Howell and Rudger Hauer. Rest in peace, Rudger. Rest in peace, man. Fuck the remake. It should never have been remade in the first place. I wish I knew what the hell the rights issue was. Like, no one can seem to find it to give this a full official release in the U.S. It's a fucking shame. Because it was released one time on DVD, I think it's like HBO video type of thing, but this is an intense, wonderful road thriller. Robert Harmon does some really excellent work with vehicles and sense of timing, suspense. Roger Howard is such a almost mythical type of figure. Is he just a crazy person? Is there something more to him? Is he a guy who is this figure that just wants to test C. Thomas Howell's resolve? Is he trying to teach him a lesson of manhood? Is he just a weird you know, psychopath? You don't quite get a handle, but there's a lot of ideas you float around. Because he'll do things that seem impossible, like he's great aiming, he takes down a fucking police helicopter, he takes down a whole police uh, 
station. He's either that good or maybe he's like Martin Riggs. If Martin Riggs and Lethal Weapon snapped, they can't touch me. Maybe he was, you know, you never know. Maybe he was, what, maybe he was a lethal weapon, but he didn't have Roger Murtaugh to help him. See, this is Martin Riggs if he snapped. Don't you know who he is? Roger Howard, see, that was how it played off each other so well. And, I mean, Robert Harmon, I don't understand Sister and Eber's hatred for this film. It makes zero sense. This is such a well-made movie. And some people just don't get it. The Hitcher. Written by Eric Redd, who would go on to direct Body Parts with Jeff Fahey in the 90s. Another underrated film, among others. Ah, another one. This is a fan trailer. Don't bother with The Hitcher 2. Don't bother with the remake. I think I've seen this fan trailer. It's well done. I think one of those, like, take a movie and try to make a modern trailer out of it. What you say? Yeah, I want you to stop me. And maybe, you know, Roger Howard's character, he's a guy that's been trying to find someone to stop him. And once C. Dallas Howell actually got the guts and will to push him out, it's like, hey, maybe this guy's the, the guy that taped me down. And the fact, the fact is, Roger Howard's Terry is such a mystery, but it's interesting. And you come up with, he's just so intense. Such a wonderful role he played. And see, that was how it was a good foil, and you really felt sorry for him. I think the sheriff, or the, the, the cop there in the white hat is... I think Jeffrey DeMond is his name? I know he was the sheriff in The Blob remake in 1988. And he's been in a few other films too. He has some beautiful vistas. Some blue, just really good cinematography. Some great looking shots. And like, people got such butthurt about the thing with Jennifer Jason Lee. You don't see anything. You don't see anything. It was more powerful in this in that instance because your mind created it. But you didn't see anything. Oh, I saw some. No, you probably shied away, but that's because it's an intense movie. Like, this is one of the tops of the, the cat and mouse quality of film. Cat and mouse. Who's the cat? Who's the mouse? Once a hunter, will you turn this guy to be a hunter? Or will always forever be the hunted? I would love to have seen this film in the theater. I wish. Coming from Paramount. Ah, My Bloody Valentine. Very cool. One of my favorite 80 slasher films. Especially the uncut version. So glad the uncut version came out. And then Stream Factory, the day of credit, they released a, a special edition. And they cleaned that up. That, that cut footage, they cleaned it up and looks wonderful. But I love the setting in the mines. I love that. The look of the killer is very creepy and iconic. The uncut death scenes are wild. The love triangle I didn't mind because I thought the actors did their jobs well. Sally, the the lead guy, he passed away, Sally. The guy who comes back into town, he's been away for a while. He's our, our lead. Sally, he's passed away. May he rest in peace. <coughs> There's a lot of nice little details, like these little creepy poems, and you feel sorry for this lady, and then you find her dried up in this dry the in the dryer. I even liked the the police officer here. He wasn't an asshole. He took the situation seriously. 
He even told them, don't have this, don't, don't do it. <clears throat> and I think the setting just worked in this creepy aesthetic with the miner like knocking all these light bulbs out. I even liked the song at the end, the Ballad of Harry Warden. And so they say on a Valentine's Day. This woman's death scene is definitely one of the, the more grisly, especially the uncut version. Yeah. But Sally didn't do well because there was thoughts of a sequel, but eh, it just didn't work out. Maybe for the better, just one movie, maybe a sequel would have ruined it. Now this is The Burning, which has, they're not the stars, but you have roles with Jason Alexander from Seinfeld, or going to do Seinfeld. Fisher Stevens, who were going to do Short Circuit 1 and 2. Also, I think Holly Hunter. Also, the woman who would be the kind of love interest in Bloodsport. She's in this. Got some effects by Tom Zavini. This is actually... He did not do Friday 30 Part 2 because he went and did this movie. And I like the film. When it gets to the raft scene, that's kind of when... It shoots his low, so to speak, because that's definitely the the last biggest. It's the biggest and the last big makeup effect gore scene with all these tears detail in this raft. It's definitely the scene people remember the most from this. And the the movie flutters a little bit after that, but I I don't mind it. It was a damn refreshing that kind of your final people are guys instead of just the typical girls. Yes, Weinstein films. The Weinsteins were behind producing it. Just how it was. But I don't mind the burning. Oh, this is the Slumber Party Massacre. Yeah, I remember not minding the film for what it was. I remember having a, a little bit of fun. I don't know if I would say it's a favorite of mine. It's been a while since I've seen it. I, I think I've only seen it once. I know it got sequels. It got Slumber Party Master 2, which was a weird wannabe by Nightmare on Elm Street mix with a slasher. Well, I guess you could say Elm Street's a slasher, but it was trying like a wannabe Elm Street film. And then Slumber Party Master 3 was like another deal. And then there was like a film called Sorority House Master that stole footage from this movie. Yeah, I think like Sorority House Masters, like, is it connected to this or not? But stealing footage from this movie? Kind of a weird thing. I mean, this does have a, a bit of a sense of humor to it. I mean, the, the whole... One of the things that makes this film stand apart is that it's one of the few slasher films in the 80s that was directed by a woman. So whether you want to say this is like a feminist slasher film... And like, well, if it is, then it's better than X and some of these other fucking movies that are f feminist, like, whatever the hell it is. I'll watch this instead. And of course, that drill, you could guess what that's supposed to mimic. Uh, Motel Hill. A unique film, a, a unique story. It takes all sorts of critters to make Farmer Vincent's fritters. But yeah, you have these two people who kidnap people, <laughs> bury them, and I guess you say grow them. Fan them up and grow them like vegetables. It's just a very weird premise. And even did like a little chainsaw fight at the end. I, I remember liking this okay. I remember this being alright. Like the, the two villains. Like the hero, he's a bit of a schlep. You know, he's a bit of a, a stoop. Our hero of the film. 
That was a nice touch, Motel. Hello, the thing braces Motel. That was a nice touch. I remember it being okay. It's not like a favorite of mine, but Motel Hell is, is decent. Uh, Blood Feast. First they meet you. No, uh, first they greet you, then they eat you. This was a clever trailer. Because this stuff is specifically shot for the trailer. And it's a guy trying to offer the audience the exquisite cuisine of this restaurant. And you just, even the, the guy promoting it realizes just how fucked up this movie is while he's talking about it. It's a very clever way of doing a trailer. But it also details that there is a sense of humor to this all. By the same director who did the, the Bean. And, uh... The director of this film... I don't know, I think from doing a review of this... She actually left a comment... This was on my old channel, I believe. On my old channel, I think I reviewed this movie. And the director, who is a female... She left a comment, and then at one point... Mentioned it on like a website she had. And she she liked what I said about it. Because I thought this was a very weird. Quirky. You know, fun bit of movie. It's pretty funny. It's it's pretty insane. This is one of those movies I don't even. Blood Feast. Not Blood Feast. Uh, God. Blood Diner. You ever got you ever brain in the jar with eyes going, you got that right, homo? <laughs> blood Dimer. I don't know why I thought of Blood Feast. Because in a way it's a remake of Blood Feast. That's why. But it's Blood Diner. First they greet you, then they eat you. Very clever trailer though. But yeah, Blood Diner is the film. I almost don't want to give anything away. Just check out Blood Diner and you'll if you want weirdness. Just check out Blood Diner. <laughs> Ah, uh, The Tested Chainsaw Master, Part 2. Directed by Toby Hooper, with effects by Tom Zavini. Uh, Toby Hooper knew that he could not create another serious horror film to beat out the first film. So his idea is, let's have fun with a bit of a tongue-in-cheek tongue kind of sequel. I thought it worked out well. I mean, I understand why he went in that direction. And uh, Dennis Hopper was a lot of fun. And to be honest, it's the best chainsaw film we've had. Probably the last great chainsaw film, honestly. Uh, we got Bad Dreams from 1988, which I know some people felt it was an Elm Street ripoff, which is the whole person dies and they come back in dreams and visions, and you even have. With Jennifer Rubin, who was in Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. You also have, uh, God, I forgot, is that Bruce Abbott, who was in Reanimator. And you also have, oh, what's his name? He played Chainsaw in Summer School. Cameron, God, I forgot his name. Now, of course, Richard Lynch, who's the bad guy in the Chuck Doors from Vision USA, Sally, he's passed away. He plays our villain. I know some people really did not like the twist, which I guess I won't give away the twist for those who haven't seen Bad Dreams. I can understand people feeling that the twist is a cop-out. I can understand that. But... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of in between. Like, I like the film. The twist, I thought, makes it kind of interesting. But I just feel... Like they watch this trailer, they're expecting one film, and then I just see how people felt the the twist was a cop out. I can understand that that notion. Again, bad dreams. People just felt okay. It's a number Elm Street film, so people who did see they wanted an Elm Street type of movie, and then oh shit, it's not that. What the fuck? You lied. <laughs> Yeah, this actually came out. I have the Arrow video release thanks to my good friend Mike OCP. Gotta give credit to him because he had one that was busted, so he got another one. Um, but the disc works, which is all I care about. 
Tian Furry's in the film for a little bit from Dawn of the Dead, but he's not in it too much. Pauly Shore's in this. I don't know if he's in the trailer, but Pauly Shore has a pretty decent supporting role. Yeah, there it is. A Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. I know even the director didn't like the Eric's Revenge part, because the Eric's Revenge in the trailer makes it seem as if this was a sequel. Just people are like, who the fuck is Eric? They just want to call it Phantom of the Mall, but the pro studio producer whatever said no. This is a fun slasher film. I, I This was enjoyable. It's not high grade with the acting, but it has enough visceral th you know, gore. It's not the gore, but it has a couple decent kills. has a little bit of action. I mean, the Phantom even knows a bit of Kung Fu. Uh, it, it's fun for what it is. And Pauly Shore, he's actually pretty tolerable in it. Pretty, pretty tolerable. But, okay, we got The Serpent in the Rainbow. Bill Pullman did a wonderful job in this. One of his best roles. And a West Craven film, the loosely based on the story of the guy that went to Haiti for the zombie drug. Tetratotoxin from the, the fish. That could be like act like a poison. But of course, utilized more in the supernatural. The Blu-ray for this was very disappointing because Bill Pullman's on the commentary, but he leaves because he's got a thing to do halfway through, and then the rest of the commentary is silent. And it's like right before the scene where he's in the chair. It's like, okay, that's the only like scene would be worth exploring. How was he doing this fucking intense scene naked in the chair where supposedly your disc going to be nailed to the chair? But no, you can't wait for him to. Uh, <laughs> Just do an on-camera interview and ask him these questions or something. But the great movie, shitty Blu-ray. Rest in peace, Wes Craven. Does that Blu-ray, there's a lot of stories about the film. I don't think they were as explored as they could have been on that Blu-ray. But yeah, I love Serpent of the Rainbow, one of my favorite Wes Craven films. And the state of like a lot of voodoo movies at the time. There was The Believers, which is a good one. This is a, what, Phantasm 2? We got three minutes left, so. Yeah, this is Phantasm 2. In my opinion, the best of the Phantasm movies. A lot of sequels kind of did this where they went to a sequel and they there's a bit more of an action feel. Like even Evil Dead 2, with the shotgun, the chainsaw, there's a little bit of an action feel. Aliens, a bit more of an action feel. This film is a little bit more of an action film. Even Hellraiser 2, I don't know if I say action, but this is a bit more up in the ante. So a lot of sequels, even horror sequels, did that, which was cool to see. The thing about I don't like about the Phantasm story overall is that there is no ending. And I think that was the point all along, is that there's never an ending. Every single movie is a cliffhanger, and then whatever is set up is kind of done away. Like, these tears, like, her, her character is done away in Phantasm 3. Like, that's only in the trailer, it's not in the movie. So, I'm wondering if it's going to have Chud, or April Fool's Day, or some other films on this list, because there's about two minutes left. Because, I'm like, is Chud on here, or April Fool's Day, or? Oh, this is Waxwork. Watchworks is another good movie. Zach Galligan. Star of Gremlins. And I love Watchworks 2 Lost in Time. That's a lot of fun. But there's, I like the idea of all these watch museums. There's uh, watch figures and each one is a dimension. So it's like you do have a lot of mini horror films in one. It's almost like an interesting way where it's, it's an anthology but it's not an anthology. So it's kind of cool, like, you do go to these different worlds like an anthology, but it's all part of the same story. But it's like, you do have a mummy story, you do have a vampire story, you do have a werewolf story. But still in the more same consistent flow because of this waxwork motif. And then you get, like, a really cool looking werewolf and a god getting ripped in half. There's John Reese davies from Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's Zach Gallagher and Deborah Foreman. I get a dick. But yeah, this is, I believe, the, the last one. So that'll be the end of it. Um, 
I don't know, maybe he didn't have time, so... Because I know that, yeah, there's no April Fool's Day or Chud or some of the other films. But still, I mean, there's a lot of good horror films on this list. But there's a lot of great horror films of the 80s. It's a great decade for films. Creativity, effects work, ingenuity, probably fueled by cocaine. But they really try for the fences and the variety. Just the variety of different kinds of horror films was a great thing to behold during that time. Great thing to behold. So... And that's why, you know, a lot of people think of the 80s as a great time for movies and horror films. Because, again, just the whole idea of what can we do next that hasn't been done before. So, with that said, thank you guys for watching. Take care. Um, thank you once again, Efri, for your kindness. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.